I'm very pleased to say I'm now joined by the Professor of Contemporary Islamic Studies at Oxford University, Mr. Tarek Ramadan. Good morning, Tarek. Good morning. Professor Ramadan or Tarek? Tarek. Thank you very much. That should take away some of the formality <laughs> straight away. Um, I want to play you um, a clip of a caller to our show last week because I think it symbolises a lot of the friction within Islam. And I'd like to find out what you think about what this uh, young man has to say about his interpretation of Islam. His name was Abu Isa. Here I'm is. a third generation Muslim. Mm. I'm a northerner. I live in Birmingham. I migrated to Birmingham, Birmingham only because of the fact that I was finding it extremely difficult to practice my faith. I'm a very devout Muslim. Moved to Birmingham so I could live in a community that accepts me as opposed to living up north where I would get called racist names. My wife wears the niqab. She'd get abuse at her. So I said, what's going on here? I'm third generation Muslim. I'm British, yet nobody seems to kind of like accept me. So me, I've known 30 odd years. I've had racism. But once I started practicing, this is after September the 11th when everything started going towards Islamophobia. Now I believe it's become very, very mainstream. We have been a target for a long time. Uh, so let's jump on the bandwagon. It's all, the, it's all Muslims. And I feel my religion, the way I practice it, and I want to challenge any Muslim, it is not compatible by living in the UK. No way. It, you, cannot be, you, not, you cannot be a devout Muslim and live in the West. Can I just ask you, are you going to bring up your children and say to them, you cannot have Jews, Christians as friends? If the book says it, then I have to go off what the book says. If your children go to a school and they have friends who happen to be Jewish and Christian, will you say that they cannot be your friends? That's what the book says. Right, so yes, you will tell your children that I they... Will, I will say, read the book and practice what you can, ordained so by you're, God. So you're saying to all Muslims listening, to be true Muslim, you cannot have Jew, any non-Muslims as friends? Not any non-Muslims. Specifically mentioned in, in the Quran is about Jews and Christians. Tarek, listening to Abu Isha speak there and say that as a devout Muslim, I cannot have friends who are Jews and Christians, that as a devout Muslim, I cannot live in the West. What is the counter argument to that belief? I think there are two, two, two dimensions here. The first is his understanding of Islam. And, and when he's saying, come back to the book, the Quran, I, I would say to him exactly the same. You have to come back to the book and you will see that your interpretation, it's a narrow interpretation of uh, verses sometimes that are completely taken out of context because the, the mainstream Islamic message is about being uh, in touch with all the human beings. And how could you avoid being... Uh, uh, in touch with people of other faiths or within, even he without. He didn't say faith. that. He said friendship. So no, well, even we, friendship, even friendship. If you have a, 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 an Islamic tradition coming from the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, the best among you is the best for humanity, is the best serving humanity. You serve your friends and you can have friends who are not Muslims. I myself was born and raised in Switzerland with people of other faiths. I was, a, a, you know, it was a tiny minority there, not many Muslims and all my friends were Muslims and, and, and non, uh, I mean non-Muslims and very few were Muslims. So, so in reference to battles that took place in the early days between the Prophet Muhammad and the residents of, of Mecca, um, within this context it is said that you cannot be friends with Jews and Christians. That's what Abu Isha quoted to us. When we were speaking no, but to that, him. and he's taken that and said that is what's what it says. Therefore, I can't. No, no. That this has to be contextualized in times of war, because what was said in the Quran is you cannot take non-Muslims as friends against the Muslims, meaning to betray the Muslims with people of other faiths. But that but, is a justification, Tarek, because of course there are many Muslims who believe that we are at a stage of war no, between not, the West. So th there are this, Americans and that, that's drones good, dropping yeah, bombs yeah. on Muslims. Uh, no, that's, a good, the, that's, that's a good point because we have to come to our second uh, point, which is his understanding of the West and his understanding of Britain. And, and there is a confusion here between your fellow uh, citizens and, and, and the governments and some of the decisions coming from the government. Of course, we have to be critical 
you are a British Muslim and you have to be loyal to your country. But your loyalty to the country should be a critical loyalty. Meaning, as a British Muslims, you should be able to say to your own government, what you are doing, your government, I mean British mm -hmm. government, what you are doing in other countries, supporting dictators, supporting violence, and sometimes being quiet when it comes to the way Palestinians are treated, this is against our own values in Britain, because this discrimination or this in in inequality that we are facing, it's as if today in Britain the life of Arabs and Muslims is uh, 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 less valuable than the life of uh, 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 it's less valuable than the life of British and white British uh, 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 soldiers or, or, or men and women. And but your, your is, loyalty, um, Tariq, to the Ummah should supersede your loyalty to man-made laws? Never. That, we, that we, we don't have something like this, and this is a misunderstanding. Our loyalty first is our, to our principles. And if within my Ummah, within my religious community, I have a Muslim who is acting wrongly. My commitment to my community is to stand up against him. And we have a saying coming from the, the, the messenger saying, help your brother when he's right or wrong. And one of the companions asks, how can I help my, comp my, my brother when he's wrong? stop him from doing wrong. That's the active attitude that you need to have. So we are not blindly supporting Muslims. And me, as a Muslim today, I have the duty as a Muslim scholar to stand up and to say to the people in Iraq or in Syria or wherever they are who are killing innocent people and spreading violence, that in the name of Islam, I should be the first as a Muslim to say that what you are doing is anti-Islamic. This is also what I, I did with anti-Semitism. Anti Anti-Semitism is anti-Islamic. So I should stand up and to say to anyone who is justifying any kind of anti-Semitism because we are against uh, uh, the, the state of Israel and its policy that that cannot be right. We have to be against anti-Semitism and stand up and say to the Israeli government what you are doing with the Palestinians. It's unfair, unjust, and you are massac it's a massacre of uh, 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 the people in the occupied territory, civilians. Mm. Um, lots of questions have come in for you, um, Tarek. Um, Ross tweeted saying, were the people who committed the Paris atrocities Muslims? And if not, why not? No, I think that, you know, uh, there is a position of principle. Anybody who is saying I'm a, I am a Muslim, I cannot say you are not. Mm. That's the, the starting point of the discussion. So they were Muslims and they were uh, arguing, or at least they said that they were uh, uh, behaving in the name of Islam. They were and avenging this, the Prophet. Exactly, this is what they said. So we have to take a position by saying, look, I'm not going to deny the fact that you are Muslim, but I'm denying the fact and rejecting the fact that what you did is Islamic. So what you did is not. And I'm making a difference between judging the people and judging the, the actions by saying this is anti-Islamic. Now, But there are blasphemy laws in Pakistan, for instance, mm. that would condone the death, certainly the imprisonment, of anyone who drew a cartoon of the Prophet. So here, immediately, on a global standpoint, you have discrepancies, don't you? Because there are blasphemy laws across the Islamic world, which would mean that people would be put to death for doing things such as this. Therefore, even though they were in a country where those blasphemy laws are not appropriate, they were enacting upon religious diktats that say that they are. No, there is a difference. First, let me start with the discussion about what is happening in Pakistan and the law and the legal framework. It's quite clear that we need to be self-critical. What is happening in Muslim majority countries by killing the people, who, you know, the blasphemy uh, 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 law and the way we are dealing with people, that's not acceptable. I think that we need... Really, is it un-Islamic though? Uh, I th yes, I would say that these laws are an Islamic in the way they are implemented. The fact that we are spreading around the message as Muslims, that you have to respect the faith of others, is something. But you cannot come with something which is a law, which is killing the people who are insulting. That, I would say, it's not Islamic. So, life, so life imprisonment would be acceptable under blasphemy laws, but not 
execution. No, I wouldn't say that. I would I would go further than that by saying uh, in a society where we are cherishing uh, um, uh, freedom of expression, it has to come with a decision from the society, not only from a government that is betraying day in, day out the Islamic principles and come with one Islamic principle that we want to protect. In fact, to instrumentalize religion by saying, look, we are respecting religion by killing people. No, I think that we are promoting and we should promote freedom of expression. But with the freedom of expression, what should come from a society is also a sense of responsibility, decency. So, so there should be no sanction for those who mock the Prophet Muhammad? I, I would say the the sanction that we have now in Muslim majority countries are completely wrong. I would say it's much more something which has to do with an ethical education about the way you use your right. And I would say if a society comes to something which is avoid insulting as a legal framework, avoid insulting, I could understand that. But the way it's done now, it's pure hypocrisy. But, but then what is the sanction for those who do not avoid mocking the prophet. No, I, 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 I wouldn't go for... for so there's any, any you know. sanction. So it would be completely acceptable for you, even in Islamic countries. Um, not acceptable, of course, not you're condoning it, but there would be no sanction for it. I, I think we have to go towards this freedom of expression, yes. I, I would like... That puts you at odds with many hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world. I, I, don't, I don't care about this. I don't think that you are educating people with uh, law that are uh, preventing them from speaking. I would like more education about the wise way to use your rights. And in Muslim majority countries as well, it's not only in the Muslim majority countries, in India, for example, we are used to something which is, look, we don't ridicule, we don't uh, uh, laugh at religion. So let us have this sense of decency instead of coming with, you know, when you are obsessed with, it's wrong, kill the people or judge them. It means that you are in a state of weakness. You don't know how to deal with this. And I don't think that we are going to solve the problem with law. We are going to solve the problem with education. Does that not then highlight a fundamental culture clash between East and West in that respect? That the West is iconoclastic. It has been for centuries and the East is not. Therefore, what does that say about immigrant populations in the West? Because there are those who argue that it's incompatible, as indeed Abu Isa said, to be a devout Muslim and live in the West. That's almost an argument for that, what you're saying. No, not really. I, I think that first what he's saying, it's, it's, I'm not sure that it's right. You can be a devout Muslim and, and live in the West, as long as once you understand better your religion, the scriptural sources, and at the same time the West. Because this very uh, superficial understanding, because some are criticizing you, you, you think that all your fellow citizens are the same, that's not true. Now in the way you are putting things, I, I think that we have to go deeper than that. Because even in the West, you have Christians and you have Jews. They don't like the way we are laughing at religion. It's not something East and West. It's, it's deep. I, I, I met many people in France, many people here in Britain, even here in Britain. But the reaction's say, different, isn't it? That's, that's fine. The, but, yeah. but this is something which is important. There is so much frustrations in Muslim majority countries that the only way is to take to the street and, and just shout because there is no space for civil society. We need to change this. We need more freedom in the Muslim majority country and not to instrumentalize this frustration against the West, which so, is what some, some, some governments are doing. So the burning of churches in Niger, for instance, is really a manifestation of other frustrations, but because, of course, they can't frustrate perhaps in a democratic sense, it becomes violent and they, this is just the spark that sets that off. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it's even deeper than that. You know, people in Nigeria, 2,000 were killed at the same time where 12 were killed or 17 were killed in Paris. And he went to Paris, the president, the Niger's president, went to Paris to support uh, France and nothing was said about 2,000 people being killed. It's as if he's so much in the Western uh, 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 rational that he's forgetting the African one. So the population is coming against him and the, the opposition is using this. So I, I would say here that it's deeper than Est versus East. It's very much about uh, something which is happening even in, in, in the West. The target mainly 
uh, is the Muslims, and we know this. There is a great deal of Islamophobia, and we are now celebrating this freedom of expression very often uh, against, in fact, uh, 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 Muslim symbols, while before it was, main, it was also about Christian symbols. So there is something which is a tension with the Muslim presence in the West now. It's up to the Western Muslims now to understand the very critical role they have to play in between the, the two universes of reference in the West and in Muslim majority countries, to, to, as I have been doing this for years now, is to go back to Pakistan, to Africa and say, look, that's not the way we are going to solve the problem. We are not going to solve the problem of corruption, lack of democracy, human dignity in the West or in, in, in Africa, in the East, only by shouting against the West. That's not going to be uh, 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 the solution. Do you then agree with the letter that was sent by the community secretary, Eric pickles to Muslim organisations stating that they have to do more to conflate British values with Islamic values and instil in young British Muslims a feeling that they are British and that they need to be proud to be British as well as Muslim. Do you agree with these sentiments contained I, within that? I, I have a problem with the way it was done and the substance of what was said. Because the way it was done, just to send a letter to the, the, the leaders and saying, this is what I'm expecting from you, it's as if, you know, they once again have to justify their work and it's as if uh, they were not doing it. And the second is the substance. Now, if we are serious about uh, radicalization, about the sense of belonging to the country, this is where he has to start by finding a way to trust his Muslim fellow uh, uh, citizens, which is not the case now. There is a great deal of mistrust between the government. And so how, by sending a letter, you will get trust? No, you sit with them. You have something which is a long, uh, uh, a long, uh, you know, a long run policy that you build with your fellow uh, Muslim citizens. And then you come with something which is, what do we need in Britain today to make the Muslims uh, feel at home? It's only by Muslims talking to Muslims the most important problem is has to do with the reasons why do we have this radicalization so come now with some of the questions that we have and we have to solve together educational policy urban policy social policy what is done to 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 make them feel that they are respected uh, as citizens on an equal footing which is not the case and then come to another reasons Another reason which is also important is the foreign policy, is what is happening around the world. If you keep quiet with Palestinians being killed and then you ask your citizens to feel at home in Britain where you have a double standard when it comes to international reaction and in, in, in the international scene, I think that this is problematic. So I would say, yes, Muslims should do more. But they are not alone. It's a shared responsibility. The government should do more and should do more domestically and should do more internationally. Um, George Stroud on Twitter asked Tarek, how do we deal with the crisis of leadership amongst Western Muslims? Firstly, you have to admit that there is a crisis of leadership. And if you do admit that, how do you deal with it? You know, I, there seems I wrote... to be a disconnect. Between more, the than young. That, more, more than that, I, I wrote a book a few years ago, Radical Reform, and I was saying that there is a crisis of authority in Islam today at the international level. Now, if you come to Western Muslims, that's true. We are facing a crisis. We don't know who is talking, who is speaking for Muslims today. We don't know at the, uh, in, in, in the States. But who will Canada. ever? Because you, there's no Pope. If you're Shia, you do have an Ayatollah who has a degree of, uh, and then ultimately it comes down to local levels, and then really, you have the Quran and the Hadith, yes, and then but, people who interpret that for you. Yes, but now we have to look at what is happening, and the fact that it was an asset for us not to have a central authority, should now not be a, a liability with having divisions, and this is why we have to come together. I think that you are right, the only common references are uh, the Quran and the Sunnah, the prophetic traditions. But now uh, we really need to organize ourselves. We know what the Muslims need today. It's an intra-community dialogue, intra-community dialogue between Shia and Sunni. It's, it's uh, one in, 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 in the book. Uh, uh, and Ahmadiyya? Uh, 
uh, Ahmadiyya, Ahmadiyya for the Muslims are outside what is Islamic, but we cannot reject them in the dialogue. So we can have a dialogue, but we are not considering somebody who is saying there is a prophet after the prophet as a Muslim. So the fact that I, I said this to uh, a responsible uh, uh, in uh, uh, of the Ahmadiyya saying, uh, I want to be in dialogue. Say, yes, it's an interface dialogue. That I, letter was co-signed by Lord Ahmad, who's an Ahmadiyya. That's not a problem. So I don't Would have that a... have undermined, though, the message going especially... Actually, it was one of the few things that Sunnis and Shias agree on, isn't it? Yes, but that's, they're, that's, they're, that's, they're, I would say I would say we have now uh, we we should talk uh, w within you know the mainstream we are considering because some of the Salafi for example are considering the Shia as non-Muslim yes so what I'm saying is we need to start step by step the mm. first is Shia and Sunni should come together and have a dialogue and have a dialogue and 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 we know now that uh, it's a critical discussion that we need and and the, the in the Arab awakening my last book I was talking about this thing is one of the main challenges of the coming year if we are not going to solve this it's going to be a problem now add to this uh, trends that we have within and we don't only have you know uh, moderate Muslims and 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 radical Muslims we have six seven trends from the reformist the rationalist the traditionalist the literalist we need to have a dialogue we need to come together and it should start we need a national movement of local initiatives and it's there that you have to come to start to have this dialogue we are not doing this and add to this the cultural belonging so you have people coming from bangladesh people coming from arab countries people coming from african countries people coming from asian countries we don't talk we have even our own mosques and so it's completely scattered if we don't start this dialogue and and, and we are responsible of organizing ourselves don't uh, blame governments to to use this have you found tarek that you'd find it easier for a Sunni imam to have an interfaith dialogue with a, a Jew or a Hindu or a Sikh than he would with a Shia. Yes, that's that's the reality of it. I think it's easier to have interfaith dialogue than intrafaith dialogue. Right. But it's not only, you know, it's the same if you well, listen Catholics to the, the and Protestants. Catholic, exactly. And, yes, we all have Presbyterians having, say, and Baptists exactly. and Quakers. And, exactly. Yeah. We all have these problems. But uh, I, I would say that this is something that we, we need to, to, to organize ourselves. And we are the first responsible for that. But the difference, of course, between the intrafaith dialogue that goes on amongst Christians and that which goes on amongst Muslims is, is the bloodshed associated with what goes on. I mean, the whole ISIL-ISIS thing essentially is a Sunni-Shia thing. If you think about Hezbollah and Iran helping out Ashad, uh, Assad because he's Shia, and then um, it is Sunni extremists involved in uh, ISIL, isn't there, it? There, there is this part of the equation between Sunni and Shia, but it's also internal to Sunni. Because some of them, they, uh, if you are not supporting them, it means that you are the, against them. You are murtad, meaning that you are uh, uh, denying the very essence of Islam. And the, you are even more dangerous than somebody who is not a Muslim. This is why they are killing so many uh, fellow Muslims, yes. because they are more dangerous. So, so it's very complex and yes. very complicated here. Uh, and this is where uh, we need to come to this discussion without forgetting the political side also of the equation because because we cannot just uh, talk about you know religious tensions we are here dealing also with political interests and this is where also the west is not always consistent with whom they are supporting. For example, when it comes to the Gulf states, we are supporting them, but we all know that the Gulf states or some organizations or some individuals coming from the Gulf state are supporting the Salafi literalists. And the Salafi literalists are not uh, spreading around an ideology that is telling you be a Western Muslim. Quite hmm. the opposite. Isolate yourself in the West is the only way to be a Muslim. This is what they are spreading around. Uh, Imtiaz wants to speak to you and has called in. Sorry to have kept you waiting for so long, Imtiaz. No uh, what would you like to ask, Tariq? Uh, Salam, Tariq. Uh, I want to ask about, well, you, look, uh, you know you were talking about intra, uh, intra-Muslim conversation. Hmm. But I think that that view is, and I, and I respect you a lot, Tariq, and, uh, in, in many things you do, but I think that that's, still too soft because when you talk about Sunni Shia uh, conversation and then you reject Ahmadiyya's you're not you're only doing what's one step more than Salafis rejecting Shias I think what needs to happen is an open platform where we say okay this is an open platform if you if you consider yourself Muslim you're welcome to join in here because I'll tell you why I'm I, so I, as an apostate myself of Islam 
um, I've slowly built build, building up some friends who are Muslims. They are they could be you know progressive Muslims. So they, some of them might be gay. Some of them might be female imams. But also some some more conservative Muslims who are willing to speak with me. And what we found is that as they because they're engaging with people they don't normally engage with, um, they find it they actually in their own journey have much a broader acceptance of people than let's say a Salafi who isn't talking to a progressive Muslim. So and when you reject people's views on Islam because of context, um, I think you're not really doing anything different from what Abu Isa was doing because he was just saying, look, I'm picking up scripture and this is my interpretation of it. And you're saying you're picking up scripture. Obviously, you're, you're more educated in terms of Islam than him. But there are many people who would take his view who are educated. Um, who might be scholars. I, I, hmm. Tarek. Look, I, I don't think that uh, uh, we are talking about the same thing. What I'm saying is we need a dialogue and, and, and there are levels and there are also spaces where we have to be quite clear on what we are talking about. Now, uh, from, it's not, it's uh, what he's saying is that I'm not excluding anybody. What I'm just saying, we have a mainstream understanding of what makes somebody a Muslim. So Shia, Sunni, the mainstream. Because there are norms. Because there are norms. If somebody is coming and saying the prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not a prophet. So so you might say uh, I'm Ahmadis a Muslim. Ahmadis don't say that. So, so, no, but the problem is for us, it's outside Islam. So there are norms. So so let us start with what is considered in within the mainstream as being Islamic. If you are telling me there is a prophet after the prophet, for me it's not an Islamic But position because by, by the norm by the normative definition of Islam, he is the last messenger. If you add this to this, it means that we are not entering here into a dialogue among Muslims, but it's something which is a, a religion I that I respect and that I would never reject, but it's not going to st it's not the starting I, point I, I think you're confusing two things as well because we're talking here about muslims we're not talking so much about islam because islam is a is a, is a religion and therefore it's, it's got scriptural background with we're talking about muslims the muslim communities that includes ahmadiyas like it, it like no, no, I'm, the, I'm the, not, the mainstream once I, again I once again there's a distinction between mainstream and non-mainstream would you would you admit intias that ahmadiyya is non-mainstream I mean, what, what isn't? There's, there's so many different pockets of Muslims and very large pockets of Muslims. I mean, look at... But, Iman, but they, all, Muslim. they all agree, other than Ahmadiyya, that there was no prophet after Muhammad. Would you agree with that? Uh, mostly, yes. Yes, right. So the, this is what and I'm, and so, this is what so I'm so saying. Let us, so, let us... So, so, okay, so, so in you know, in you know, wait a second. Go on, Tariq. By, 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 by starting like this, you are just ending the process. We are not going to go anywhere by starting like this. Is that like because, because Sunnis and Shias would refuse to sit down with? Uh, and if they the starting, would the starting by they say, who are you talking? It's, it's in the name of dialogue, you are going to accept things that they are refusing. So I think that I want first to start with the people who are ready as Muslims and understanding what Islam because you, you 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 want to talk about Muslims and I want to talk about Muslims in the way they're understanding Islam that there are norms and there is maybe, something maybe that we can let me finish in, that we can so, call sorry, the right. we, we, we can st we, we should start with the mainstream this is the first step now I was uh, uh, meeting and I was discussing with Ahmadiyya and for me it's an interfaith dialogue in the way they are looking at uh, 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 the norms so so and this is possible but we we should not confuse things so I, and we should not question, start Tariq. by I'll, the wrong uh, with question. the wrong would you, step would you would you, i'll ask you a question would you one more question go many, on sure there are many muslims who accept um gay uh, muslims to be a thing like that's okay they accept that being gay and muslim is compatible would you say that that is also an islamic and therefore it's inter interfaith rather than interfaith it has nothing to do with this because we are touching with something which has to do with al-aqidah which is the creed and the creed is something different one of the principles of the Muslim creed is the last messengers is Muhammad, uh, peace sure. be upon him. This is one thing. What you are talking about with gays here is a behavior. And anyone who has a behavior that could even be perceived as a sin by the Muslims is not putting you outside Islam because we are not touching uh, uh, upon the, the creed. So, so it's so perfectly yeah, acceptable to be gay and Muslim. So, so look, From an Islamic perspective, the mainstream is, uh, and the norm is, that homosexuality is against Islam. But it's not because you are a homosexual that you are going to be uh, considered as a non-Muslim. 
the, you can be a Muslim and behaving in the way that the mainstream Islamic uh, 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 understanding is saying it's a sin or it's condemnable. But I was asked, could somebody be a Muslim and a gay? And I said, yes, of course, because uh, his behavior does not put him or put her outside uh, the Islamic creed. We can't do that. And, and for some Muslims who are very narrow in their imputation, they are coming with something which is the, 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 the khawarij of the past uh, or the takfiri of the past is when you are a sinner, this is enough to make you a non-Muslim. That's not right. Uh, 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 when you say I'm a Muslim and you believe in the pillars and the creed, you are a Muslim. The problem that we have with al Ahmadiyya, it's not a problem of behavior. It's a problem of creed. It's a problem of principle. But what's interesting about that is that if Muslims, regardless if some regard them to be on the periphery, if Muslims themselves can't sit down and talk, then how can there be dialogue? And this is from a spectator's point of view. How can there be dialogue between, as you put it, mainstream Islam and Sikhs and Hindus who, who have no relation to the core beliefs of Islam? If someone like an Ahmadiyya who is willing to say, I am a Muslim, if you're not going to sit down and talk with them, then what hope is there for Sunni and Shia to have conversations with people who don't believe in, that, that don't even believe that the Prophet Muhammad is a prophet? Once again, uh, there are two different things. We are not saying we don't want to sit with you and talk. We are saying there is something which are the Islamic norms and there is an intra-community dialogue. Now, but they can't to, be part of that intra They can be part of a discussion with Muslims and the mainstream Islam as interface dialogue. As the Muslim thinks that normatively there is something that is uh, uh, defining Islam, it's exactly the same with uh, Catholic and Protestant. That some were saying we are Christians. Say okay, Christianity is a big thing, and we have an, a, a dialogue within. But uh, uh, pro uh, Protestant are not Catholics. For the Muslims, there is something which is defining Islam. It's with the norms and the creed that there is no prophet after the prophet. Now we have an intra discussion into something which is our common. Uh, uh, understanding of uh, the creed. Does it mean that we are refusing a dialogue with Ahmadiyya? No, but it's not the same dialogue as the intra-community dialogue that we are having in the mainstream Islam. And you cannot ask the Muslims to deny the fact that there are norms defining the religion because it's based on principles and it's based on norms. Now, I would be against any Muslim saying that we have to target, stigmatize and discriminate uh, uh, the Ahmadi. No, I, I would be against this, but I would also come to a clear understanding of yes from an islamic viewpoint the last messenger is the last messenger and there is no messenger after him that's the point um ian in sunderland said i'm not a muslim and my question is whether it's possible for the supreme leader of muslims in a particular country or region to issue a fatwa forbidding muslims from joining jihadist groups for example issuing a fatwa forbidding british muslims from participating in terrorist acts whether here in the uk or abroad I, I, my understanding is that um this has been issued, hasn't it? By by some yes, uh, but the problem, as you were saying, we we have a problem of authority and and a problem of uh, uh, um, a very deep crisis here because no one is speaking for Muslims and uh, whoever comes today and say you cannot do this is not he's not going to be uh, he's not going to be heard or listened to, and 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 it's not going to happen anyway. So this is where. Uh, what is important now is to come together with our diversity and to be clear about the kind of education we are providing to our uh, uh, young Muslims in the West and elsewhere and to be clear on what do we mean by jihad because we need a definition. Uh, what are the conditions of, for example, uh, arm uh, 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 war and yeah. resistance and, and the legitimate resistance and in, we, in, in the way we have to deal with this. I, I think that this is something that is missing in, in, in our discourse today and we have to be quite clear. But you cannot only come and ask the Muslims to apologize for the consequences where we are not working together as to solve the reasons and the causes of these problems. Um, ISIS have announced that they want a £200 million ransom from the Japanese in order to release two Japanese hostages. What is your reaction to that? 
I think there are two things that are i- important here because we were told that they have money because of the oil. And One million we, dollars a day. Is yes, this is what we heard. And then uh, because of the oil uh, uh, price, it might be that they need money. So it might be connected to less money. Uh, but there, there is also another message that they are sending is that uh, uh, Japan was uh, uh, announcing that they are involved in the alliance and that they are going to, to, to join the alliance. And then what they want to say is that no one is going to be uh, 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 protected from our reach out. We can do whatever we want. So, so to, to target the Japanese means it's global. We can get you wherever you are uh, and we'll get your people. So, so, so it's make it, make it, making it more global even. And this is the message that they were sending. Look at what happened in Paris and they came back and, and some were saying uh, we are supporting them even though they were connected. We were told to Yemen, Al-Qaeda and not to ISIS. At the end, it's the same ideology saying we are going to get you around the world. So Japan or France or or Britain or the States, it's the same. You have an alliance against us, we are ready to get you wherever you are. Can they be defeated? Yes, I think that... uh, Can you defeat an idea? A belief system? At at least you can defeat uh, an understanding of, uh, uh, of Islam and the way they are translating this. Now, it's going to be very difficult uh, uh, to to, uh, uh, to 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 solve the problem in Iraq and in in, in Syria, but this is where, as uh, uh, Muslims, wherever we are, we need to be quite clear on this binary vision, this literalist vision, this violent extremist vision. Salafi, um, the Salaf, the you know the Wahhabi. Salafi, the Salafi are not violent and they are not political. But what they are doing with the students and when the young people is to nurture them with a binary vision. So they are not violent. What does that mean? A binary vision is we are Muslims and we are saved and all the others are not with a literalist reading of the scriptural sources. So, uh, which, which is no different to uh, the Jewish faith believing they are the chosen people. So there is no difference in that. No difference. And the Christians as well. The only thing that you have is that the way they look at the West is the West is not... We cannot be a Western Muslim because by definition being a Muslim is against uh, 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 being Western by culture. Do you think there's a growing influence of Salafism in the West? Yes, and and we know that... Does that worry you? Yes, because what I see is that I have lots of respect with their sincerity. I have lots of respect with many of them who are very, who are very sincere. And they are non-political. They are not supporting. They even are saying the, quite the opposite. We are supporting the leaders because by the only fact that they are leaders, for example, in Saudi Arabia. And they are saying we are not political. And I am responding to them. You know what? You be, non-being political is politics. In fact, you are supporting a You're regime. creating a vacuum, aren't you? And me, more than that, you are supporting uh, a corrupt regime uh, in the Gulf state in, in Saudi Arabia, and this is a problem. So I would say here uh, uh, that we, we also have to be involved in this discussion uh, by saying the mindset, if it's instrumentalized in political terms, could push people towards violence so uh, is, by, is... By, by saying this, these are your enemies. So perhaps not by design, but... Salafism is a a stop point on the path towards radicalization and extremism. Not always. I not think always. That the, for no. the great majority of the no. people, it's not. And 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 these are people who are non-violent and they are uh, strict in the way they are uh, implementing their religion. But they believe in separating that. themselves away from yes, Western they, they, they society think, and culture. Exactly. They think that. And and I can respect. But that's this. incompatible, isn't it, with living in the West? Because of course, lots of people like and it's not just Tommy Robinson, for instance, who used to run the EDL. Not not just him, but many people would think, Muslims included, that if you want to live here, engage. If you don't that, want to engage, if you feel that everything around you is decadent and lower than you, then you shouldn't be here. No, I, 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 I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm pushing the Muslims to engage, and this has been the case for 30 years. Now, I also respect somebody who said, look, I'm here in, in, I'm not against the law, I'm respecting the law, and let me on my own. I don't want to engage. I want to, as long as I don't behave against the law and I respect the country, that's fine. Let me alone. I can respect this. The problem that I have is for some, is the way they are 
in fact, for a while, not involved in politics, and they end up being instrumentalized by people who are very smart in political terms and using them against the West, and sometimes using them to show how much Islam is incompatible. The populist parties in the West are using the Salafi to tell to the world, to tell to their people, to tell to their, our fellow citizens, look, Islam is incompatible. So they are playing with this way of understanding Islam against millions of Muslims who are engaging day in, day out, they are involved in the society. So there is a game here uh, uh, and we have to be respectful of the belief but at the same time being clear on the consequences of, of some ideology. Do you believe that British politicians are reticent to criticise the influence of Wahhabism because of connections to the Saudi Arabian royal family? Of course, of course. That's, that's, that has been the case for the last 30 years. Myself, in my own country in Switzerland, I was asked to shut up and not to criticize Saudi Arabia because, in fact, they were coming with the money that is needed. So uh, we are ready to uh, be silent for the sake of money and we are paying the price of their ideology and we are giving up on ideas because we need money and we want the money of the people. So I think that uh, there is a lack of consistency. And is their ideology separatist? From what do from you mean? Western society, Wahhabi ideology is Wahhabi ideology. Just to understand this, and Salafi ideology intertwined. No, in fact, what we call Wahhabi uh, is what they themselves called Salafi. They are right. saying we are coming back to the source of right. Islam, and then it's. A, I would say to define it, it's a literalist reading of the scriptural sources. Right. So, so this is what, and and they they want to separate. It. There is no way for for them to be involved in in the West or the Western culture. So, how do you counter that dialogue? If that dialogue is increasing, and of course, because of as you pointed out, foreign policy might push young people into a more literal interpretation of Islam. How do you counter that Salafi mindset which says that you live in this decadent society, you must not hang out with these people, you must not socialise with these people, you must not have them as your friends? How do you counter that? There is something that as long as they are living and they are nurturing this for themselves and they are not instrumentalised politically, that's the decision but then how do you how do what, where, what at what point do you intervene no that's along that, that that's that, that's path, the point that the path point, of transformation no, we have to to intervene upstream by promoting in the west and especially in britain but everywhere four types of independence religious independence financial independence political independence and cultural independence. We are Westerners and we have to live here. And what we have to do is to educate our imams here. We need institutions. I'm t saying this, I've been saying this for years now. We have to institutionalize our Muslim presence in the West. Institutions where we are training imams, training our leaders, training our women and men here in the West. Second is the religious independence, is that we need also to come to our own reference to be able to come with answers to our fellow uh, uh, Muslims in the West, uh, uh, which are fatawa, legal opinions that are connected to the environment, knowing the West, knowing the society. Financial independence means that the money should come from here and not come from a state or foreign state. We have to be independent. And cultural independence is there are lots of things in the West that are culturally very good. Take them, be wise, take them as your culture. You are Westerners by culture and it's fine. There is nothing wrong with this. We are not, we are not asked to remain Arabs or Asians to be good Muslims. We need to, to, to be loyal to our principles to be good Muslim with all cultures around the world. This is where we are universalists. Uh, a specific question from Roxy in North London. Can you read Hajat Nuffel? I don't know um, if I'm pronouncing that right. After Salah for a purpose or is it Bidat? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you can. Maybe I'll yeah, pass you the piece of paper <laughs> in case my pronunciation, which it almost certainly is, um, is, uh, is confusing. I, I don't even know what that, that okay, means. Okay, let's move on then. No. Uh, I've had a nikah back home and would like to do another nikah here with the same person. Can we do that in Islam? Two nikahs with the same person. 
Uh, it depends. If 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 it's a question of uh, official recognition, yes, you can you can do it. But if you can just uh, uh, move the papers from or the documents from one country to another, one is enough. But if you want to to uh, enjoy, no problem. Mm. Um, I know you've got to go. Uh, your guest is amazing, good, kind Muslim man, and has Islamic knowledge. People like him should be given chance on air TV. You not know Tarek is all always on the TV and on the radio. Good <laughs> no, that's grief. Not... <laughs> He's on more than Anton Deck. He's on the TV. Um, uh, Mahmoud from Horton says Tarek on one hand says no prophet after holy prophet Muhammad, but every Muslim believes Jesus will come and reform the Muslims. What does he say to that? No, got... but that, that's the same. This is one of the signs of the the end of time and then it has nothing to do with a new prophet is an old prophet that came before the prophet will come back and this is the last prophet who is announcing us this so no contradiction just consistency we've run out of time hopefully you'll come back and see me again Tarek it's always good My to pleasure. speak to you Tarek Ramadan thank you very much indeed for joining us on the BBC Asian Network